Uh, so 7 Kings chapter 4, and it says, One day the widow of a member of the group of the prophets came to Elijah and cried out, My husband who will serve you is dead, and you know how to fear the Lord, but now a creditor has come threatening to take my sons a slave. What can I do to help you? Elijah replied. Tell me what do you have in your house? Nothing at all except the glass of oil, which she replied. And Elijah said, Borrow as many empty jars as you can from the friends and neighbors. Then go into your house with your sons and shut the door behind you. Pour out all the oil from the flask into the jar, setting each one aside when it is fully filled. So she did as she was told, and her sons kept bringing jars to her, and she filled one of her. And soon every container was full to the brim. Bring another judge, said to one of her sons. There aren't any more, she, she told him, and then all the water stopped flowing. When she told the man of God what had happened, he said to her, Now sell the law of the world and pay your debts, and you and your sons can live on the rest. Amen. And so I want to preach you this morning about God fills empty vessels. Amen. So let's uh let's go down and pray. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we come before you. We thank you, Lord, this morning for letting us be here once again, Lord. Fulfilling your presence this morning, Lord. I thank you, Lord. They have allowed us to be here to hear your word. I ask Lord this morning that you speak to us, they speak to our hearts, so that whatever word that you have, they you speak with power and boldness, so that you put it in our hearts and our minds, Lord Jesus, that this word may touch someone, Lord Jesus, that as they use your servant. In a mighty powerful way, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You guys can take seats. So, this, uh, this story is a long story. And uh, there's times in our, in our lives when we feel empty, right? When we feel that we have nothing to give. And sometimes we feel that when we're struggling with something, we feel that God has left us we don't feel the spirit so we feel empty and sometimes we get to ask well where's God in my life right now I, I feel empty I feel like there's nothing I can do right here in this situation by myself and there's this story about this young man uh, a Jewish man that uh, by the name of Eli and uh, he was a teenager and he tells a story about how he was put to the test in his, in his uh, faith in Christ. Now he said that he got destroyed because they were during the Nazi imprisonment in the concentration camps. He says that there was a pitiful moment in his life that he thought about how God is feeling in, in his life, how he felt that moment in his life. He says that that moment is when one of the young boys next to him was taken to execution. He says that him and many others were forced to watch this stuff going on, right? See what he, they, they made him watch, the Nazis made him watch and pass by the man that were being hanged. So it was the other man and this young child. So after you know, that this was going on, they made him walk and march in front of the execution site. And he says that when he walked by them, you know, because they can't walk, he says that the two of those were no longer alive. You know, their, their tongue were swollen and their eyes had changed colors. But there was a third one. There was a third one. And he says that it was still moving. You know, there was still light in the child. There was still life in He says that he was struggling for 30 minutes between life and death. So for one and a half an hour, he stayed struggling. And you can see that you can see this agony in his eyes, and we were forced to look at him, and forced to look at his face. And eventually, you know, he passed away. But he says that behind him, a man asked him, "Where is your God now?" And he said that he heard a voice, but the silence said, "He's here." No, he's here. No, heaven with us is God. He says that not everybody, everybody that had built the strange camps found themselves pushed to the brink of unbelief. 
Many have a hope, you know, and they stand firm and deeper in the meaning of life and, and following Jesus. He says that they got stronger in their convictions of God. Many saw God proving and hoping with what that he was still alive and well. You know, he was still caring for the needs and prepared by the characters. And that's that question that sometimes when we feel in when we feel that we're wrong or something, we ask ourselves, where, where is God? That same question we hear nowadays on a regular basis that says, where is your God? When something evil happens, yeah. when something bad happens in this world, the question gets asked, where is God now? Yeah. No, when bad things happen to the man of God, you know, it tra- tragedy strikes, and it strikes the church, and we see it in the news, and we see it in the social media, that you know, our pastor that wrote, where this happened to that church, and we see the promise that says, and many of them say, most of them say, is God going to save them? Because God doesn't exist. Because God can't save people. That's the question that we hear. And that same question gets asked to us when something happens to us, you know. When something, you know, Satan strikes, when death strikes, you know, people, friends, family members ask us, where is that God that you trust so much? Where is that God that you put your trust in so much? Where is that God that you worship so much? Where is that God that you pray to? You, you get up get early in the morning, by the way, at 6 a.m. in the morning to pray. Where is it now? Where is that God that you preach so much? Yeah. And eventually, when stuff like that happens, we tend to ask the same question. Now, I ask the question, so where is God? And where is He? It's not that I'm doubting, not that I lost my faith. In him, where I'm complaining about what I'm going through because I know that I'm going to suffer in this world. The Bible says that I'm not going to walk this walk without tribulation. Paul said it, we may tribulations and suffering with my essence in the kingdom of God. I know that, but sometimes the reason why I ask is sometimes in the middle of my trial, middle situation, I know that God's there, I know God's healing me, I know God's presence is in my heart, but sometimes I feel like I can't do this no more. I feel like I can't feel his presence. Wow. And I'm not complaining and saying, where are you, God? Why are you not saying, I need you right now in this moment, God. I need you in my life at this moment. Mm-hmm. Because many times we have felt his presence, many times we have felt that God's been with us, but sometimes we feel that we're fighting on our own. But when I feel empty, when I feel like I have nothing else to give, when I feel like I'm hopeless, that's what God comes and fills me up. Yeah. When I feel like I'm giving up, God says, I am here. Yeah. Because that's what He says that His strength is perfected in our weakness. Wow. When I'm weak, that's when He's strong. When I can't give up no more of me, God says, I am here with you. Yeah. When I feel empty, that's when God comes and fills me up and says, I am here to be your vessel. When that question gets asked, you know, by friends, family, I answer and said, God's here with me, working with me, getting me through the situation. Because if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be here today. Because if it wasn't for him, I would have already given up. Because if it wasn't for him, my soul would have been here. He's here with me, giving me strength. Because he says that he gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. That's how I ask him. God, when I get asked, where is God? I say, God is here giving me strength to get through this. Amen. Yeah. Because hopefulness is something that we're going to get at one point in our lives. It's something that we all do at one point. Yeah. Mary and Martha, they felt this and told Jesus, Jesus, you should have been here days ago. My brother is dead now. There's nothing to do no more. He's dead. There's no hope. All hope is lost. Wow. He's been dead for days. Jairus was asking Jesus to heal his daughter. No, Jesus was still speaking when someone from, from the house of Jairus came and told him, Your daughter's dead. There's nothing to do. Why bother the teacher come on? There's nothing to do. Your hope is lost. Just let Jesus keep doing what he's doing. But Jesus said, Don't be afraid. Just leave. 
When you feel like this, God's telling you, when people tell you there's no hope no more, you can't go any longer with this, just is telling you, don't be afraid, just believe. God's telling you today, don't be afraid, just believe. Amen. Amen. You saw this one to come to church? God's telling you, don't be afraid, just believe. That's right. You lost your job? Don't be afraid, just believe. Come on. Amen. You feel empty? Don't be afraid, just believe. That's what God's telling you today. Don't be afraid and just believe. Because the disciples, the disciples felt the same way. Maybe they experienced the same similar feeling of hopelessness after Jesus had died on the cross. You know, his body being in the grave, they probably brought questions of confusion to their lives. Their Lord, the most powerful one, the one that had the power, was overpowered. You know, the disciples felt afraid and they abandoned Jesus. They thought that if they captured him, they didn't Chapter two, and they're gonna kill us like they, 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 they did Jesus. So they left, and they scattered all over uh, Judea. After, you know, even Jesus told them, "Because they had to stay in Jerusalem." No, they went all back to their lives. You know, Peter was found back in uh, Galilee fishing again. But they thought that all of it was lost. No, when, when Jesus was dead, they thought that everything was lost. All hope was lost. But that Friday night, that felt hopeless, that felt like a disappointment, Sunday morning was turned around, and Sunday morning was brought with joy. Amen. Hallelujah. Mm. Yes, yes. When the Sunday two men, they saw hope again. They saw, they saw a joy in their lives again. Amen. They were reminded of what Jesus had told them, that on the third day, they were, he would rise up. Right. Even the angel had to tell them, why are they seeking the dead, the living among the dead? Wow. No, God has to remind us that God can help us. But instead of trusting, instead of asking, we try to do things with our own power. Wow. We try to do things our own way. Yeah. And when things don't work out, what we do is that we go back to our own lives. Mm, yeah. We say, this that I'm doing, I'm not familiar with. This that I'm struggling with, I've never felt it. You know what? I'm going to go back to where I was, where I'm familiar with. Mm. I'm going to go back to my old life where everything was fine. When I didn't have to deal with this. That's what Peter did. You know, Jesus was dead. He went back to his old life to start fishing again. He said to resume his fishing career again. Yeah. And when, when God tells us something and it doesn't happen at the moment, we go back to our life. Wow. That's true. We go back to what we're familiar with. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to go back to what I'm used to. I'm going to go back to where I know what I'm doing or where I know what to do. Because this is not familiar. This is something that I haven't gone. And we, we think of the, the apostles and say, they were with Jesus so many days. He just kept telling them, I'm going to raise up again in three days. And they kept doubting and they didn't believe. And we say, Jesus kept telling them. But the same thing with us, he, God keeps telling us that he's with us. And he is going to fight for us, but instead of what we do, we fight with our own strength. Wow. And we try to do things our own way, and that's when things will work out. And say, I'm going to go back to where I was familiar with. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go back to the life that I know. Come on. See, this widow was in a tough situation. For, you know, the ones that are mothers, you guys have been for your sons. Amen. Someone was about to take her sons and take them as slaves. You know, the Bible says that she owed some money or she owed a debt and she had no, no way to pay it. And the, the way things work back then is that when there was a widow, she really didn't have much to say. People would take advantage of of widows, they would take their land, they would take you know, whatever it was, they didn't have much to say, but at all times, if you owe something, it was okay for the person to take the sons as slaves until the debt was paid. And she, she, she needed to pay the debt, and she didn't try to fix things in her own. The first thing she did is, I can't do anything about this, I'm going to go ask God. She went straight to God and asked for help. Yeah. 
And she didn't ask God and receive a miracle right there and then. Because she also had to listen and trust God. Sometimes when we pray, God gives us a miracle right there. But sometimes we have to listen and trust God. Amen. So sometimes we gotta do three things. We gotta ask, we gotta listen, and we gotta trust. So in order to receive help, you need to ask, right? Amen. Let me explain. But your mouth was, was a blind man. He was sitting by the side of the road. Yeah. And he heard the noise. He heard that Jesus was coming. And he said, he cried out to Jesus and said, Jesus, son of David, help me. Have mercy on me. And people were telling him to quiet. Stop shouting. But he had a great need in his life. He needed a miracle in his life. He didn't stop it. He raised his voice even louder and said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Yeah. See, when we cry out to God with the voice, with the loud voice, it's because we are in really, really need of His mercy. Yeah, man. Yeah. See, God is not too busy for, for Him to hear us, or He can't help us, or He's asleep that He can't hear, hear us. When Jesus walked, He heard this man crying out to Him. He said, wait, someone's calling me. Wow. Whatever He was doing, He said, someone needs my attention. Yeah. See, my God's not too busy to hear your cry. He might be doing something else, but when the, sound, when the man, when the child of God cries out to God, God says, wait, someone's calling me. Amen. Someone needs my help. Amen. Because if we really want a miracle in our lives, we won't stop crying out to God. Amen. We won't stop until we get it. Hallelujah. Because this, this widow cried out with a loud voice to, to, to uh, Elijah. And when we really want a miracle, when we really want something in our lives, we don't stop praying after a day or two. If you really want something, you show God that you really want it by keep on praying. She wanted her sons to stay with her. She didn't want them to be slaves. So what she did? She did everything that was possible. She did everything that was asked of her. The brother said, okay, the empty vessel. So she went around and asked for empty vessels. This is how much she was showing God how much he wanted. She wanted a miracle. Because if we stop asking after a day or two, we're really saying, oh, it's not that important if I get the miracle. Mm. You know, how bad or how bad do you want your miracle? How bad do you want that person to be saved, that person that you love? So she cries out to the prophet, and the prophet answers, but now here comes the listening part. And you guys go back to it. So verse, verse 2 says, What can I do to help you? Elisha asked. Tell me what you have in the house. She said, Nothing except a glass of oil. And Elisha said, Borrow as many empty jars as you can from the friends and neighbors. They go into the house. With your sons and shut the door behind, pour the olive oil from your flask to the jar, setting each one aside with the spill. So that was the listening part. She asked God, and then she had to listen to God. Because we're really good at talking, we're really good at asking and telling God, God, I want this. God, I want that. God, I want a house. God, I want a car. God, I want a better job. God, I want to go to that school. And we ask. But we never stop to listen to God when He tells us. Um, we make all our plans and tell Him, we bring our plans to God, but we don't listen to what He has to say. Yeah. We just want the plans that we have. Wow. Wow. You know, at the beginning of 2020, many of us had plans. Maybe we said, you know, maybe by the end of the year, I should have as much money in the bank. But then, but we struggle to pay the bills. By, by the end of 2021, I should have a house. But instead, we're struggling to pay rent. You know, but by the sound of 2021, I should have a new car or a better car. But instead, we might lose the car that we have now. And also, the plans that we had with many, many of us at the beginning of the year before the pandemic, and now none of them. Are even close to 
become fulfilled. But God's telling you, that's your plans. Your plans may fail you, but you gotta listen to my plans. He said, my plans, they come true. Now you have your plans, but your plans may fail you, but you gotta listen to the plans that I have for you. Listen to the plans that I have for your life. The plans that I have for your ministry. Mine will not fail you, mine will come to pass. We tell him all our plans, but we don't hear what he, the plans that he has for us. And, and then when he hears, or when he, when, he, when he speaks, we don't listen. When my wife is cooking, and I'm watching the Lakers lose all the time, by the way. <laughs> Uh, I'm watching the game, I'm so focused on the game that she, sometimes she cuts herself and she says, hey, come on, come on, stuff. And, I, and I say, that's great. Because I'm not paying attention to what she's saying. I'm not listening. I'm focused on the game. And she says, no, I cut myself and I have to get up and help out. Why? Because my focus is on the game. Sometimes God's telling us that to get up and do something in our lives so we can receive a miracle but we don't listen to him, we don't listen to his voice because we're so focused on our problem. We're so focused on the situation. God's telling us, this is how your miracle is coming. This is when your miracle is coming. But we keep complaining and saying, I don't see it. Why? Because we're so focused in the situation. We're so focused on our problem that we don't focus and we don't listen to, 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 to God. Amen. The other thing that she had to do, she had to trust God. No, in verse 5, this, this is what it says. So she did as she was sold. Her sons kept bringing jars there, and she filled one after the other. Soon every container was full to the brim. Bring me another jar, jar, she said to one of her sons. There are any more, he told her, and all the oil stopped flowing. She had to trust God that when she would pour out the oil, it wasn't going to stop. Now she had to trust the word of God that those vessels would be filled. And she had to trust God on what God was telling her to do. She could have said, God, what does those vessels have to do with my son? What does that oil that I have in my house have to do with what I'm asking? Wow. I'm asking to help pay for a debt. What does my oil, what does bringing jars have to do with what I'm asking? Now maybe you're struggling, God is telling you to do something, you're saying, God, what does that have to do with what I'm going through? Yeah. God, what does me preaching to that person have to do with the stuff that I'm going through in my life? What does preaching to that person have to do with the, the job that I just saw? You just have to trust God. Now we trust God with so many, with so many things. We know, we trust Him that He died for us, that He saved us, that He's going to come back again and take us into heaven, right? We trust him with so many things, but one thing we don't trust him is timing. We say, God, I want my, my miracle now and right now. And we're struggling for so many times and so long we say, when is my miracle coming, Lord? Lord, I'm running an empty here. Lord, I can't go on more. It's a bad timing now. My time is ending now. When are you going to come? And God just tells us to get away on time. We've got to trust this time. You say, Lord, I I'm empty now. I have nothing else to do with this. God says, that's when I can figure out where you're empty. Because sometimes we don't trust God. We don't trust this time. We just want things right away. I want you guys to stand up. When, uh, when I was, uh, I was uh, studying, struggling to, to, to come up with the preaching this, this week, um, I was just not that I didn't really know what to, to, to preach about. And I remember one night, I, my wife asked me, well, what do you have to about? I told I have nothing, I don't know what to preach. So I went to sleep. When I was asleep, I kept getting dreams. And a voice asked me, what do you have? And I kept saying, Nothing, I have nothing. I haven't come up with anything to 
speech. And I woke up, I woke up, and you know, I was asked the same question, what do you have? And eventually I said, I have nothing. I said, Lord, I have nothing. I said, I'm just an empty vessel. Yeah. And that's what I said. That's what I need. Amen. Yeah. Praise God. See, I want to explain to you guys that we come to God with the vessel full of our ideas, full of our wow. plans. Wow. And God says, I can't fill that vessel. Come on. There's no space for it. Wow. I need you to be in the people. Amen. Amen. Wow. So God told me, yeah. you gotta get rid of your ideas. Wow. You gotta get rid of everything. You gotta empty out your vessel for me to do so I can fill it with my spirit. I can't fill every vessel if this is already full. Oh, I need an empty vessel to work with. Today is the day that you gotta get rid of the negative thoughts. You gotta get rid of all those thoughts that you have, all the hatred that you have, and empty out your blessings and Lord, fill this vessel up. Amen. That's right. God can't fill up the vessel if it's full of junk. God can't fill up the vessel if it's full of all your ideas. God said, You want to be used by me? You gotta get rid of your ideas. And I'll put my ideas in that vessel. I'm going to put my spirit in the vessel, but you got to empty it out. <clears throat> you, come, you can't come and offer a vessel that is full to God. Yes. Amen. This world will have to bring empty vessels in order for God to fill them up. You want your vessel to be filled, you got to empty it out. Amen. You want the Holy Spirit in your heart, you gotta empty out all the hatred. You gotta empty out all those negative things. God can fill those empty vessels, but if we offer it to you, God can't work with a vessel that is full of other ideas and things that is not of God. No, today is God saying, I'm here to fill up that vessel. But if you want to bring well, me to fill it up, you gotta bring it out to the front. Empty. Amen. If you want to feel the presence of God, if you want to feel my spirit, if you want me to spirit overflow, you gotta empty it now. See, in Ephesians 3 20 says, Now all glory to God who is able to his mighty power to work with us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or even think. Amen. If we ask for God to fill us up, He's going to fill us and He can give us, give us more. More than we can ask and more than we can think. Amen. So God's saying today, you want me to fill the vessel? Bring it to the ground, but you got to bring it in. Amen. 